So again, I'm Michael Selgalid. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Human Bioethics at Monash University in Melbourne, and I'm co-moderating this panel with Dr. Dave Franz, who's a NSABB member based in Frederick, Maryland. And this panel is on discussion of science and security issues utilizing an article on a SARS-like virus as a case study. And the panel will begin with a presentation by yeah. The, the, pre the panel will begin with the presentation by Dr. Mark Dennison. And we have panelists, and Dr. Dennison is at, based at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. We'll have panelists, Dr. Murray Cohen, who's an NSABB member, and the president and chairman of Frontline Healthcare Workers Safety Foundation in Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Zah Hussein Reed, who's based at the Regional Emerging Diseases Intervention Center in Singapore. Dr. Herawati Sudoyu, who's the Deputy Director of the Eichmann Institute for Molecular Biology in Jakarta, Indonesia, and the President of the Indonesian Biorisk Association. Dr. Jeffrey Miller, who's an NSABB member based at the University of California, University of California, Los Angeles, and Dr. Masayuki Sayojo, who's the director of the Department of Virology, National Institute of Infectious Diseases in Tokyo, Japan. And with that, uh, I think let's start with the presentation by, by Dr. Dennison. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. I want to thank the organizers and, and the moderators for this, uh, the, for this uh, particular um, honor to be present. I also want to thank my, all my co-investigators, particularly the students and postdocs who performed this, Dr. Becker, Dr. Graham, and Dr. Donaldson, along with my uh, uh, chief collaborator and uh, senior co-author, uh, Ralph Barrick at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here and to talk about our, our research and, and the important questions that are the focus of this research, where really the question, um, the overarching goals of the workshop are really precisely those that we incorporated into our design, implementation, and communication of our work. Um, as a, I'll, I'll, from coming from Music City, USA, as a humble country virologist, uh, I'm also a little daunted by the sort of the environment, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, uh, to try to be cogent and also, uh, also brief um, or abjure what uh, Pascal said, which was, I have made this letter longer than usual because I lack the time to make it shorter. So I will do my best to, to, to really be uh, concise in this. Um, first of all, why do we pursue this path? I think of philosophy has a little bit to do with our discussion, actually. Um, I, th I think pursuing this initially was because of my initial background and training as a pediatrician and specialist in infectious diseases. And with my earliest actually independent work being in, in Kenya in a hospital there, in, an, in a resource limited environment where I was profoundly influenced by my exposure to, to children with vaccine presentable diseases um, that were still prevalent then, whooping, whooping cough, uh, tetanus, uh, measles, as well as endemic diseases like malaria and TB. Now, those may not be the topics here, but they really informed my concept of, of what happened in terms of trying to understand and control these. And the, the commitment uh, to the career then was predicated on really the, the capacity to try to understand, diagnose, and treat these diseases. And my immediate concerns, both during my training and subsequently as a specialist in this area, is really the, the things that we don't know and we can't learn because we, we, we don't have the capacity to grow them or to understand them. So the, the very, very, very fundamental biology associated with that and going into a parent in this day and age, even now, and saying to someone with an encephalitis or some other cause, I don't know, I don't have an answer, it's not known, I can't do anything, is, is particularly galling and feels like 1900s a medicine for me. So and that was a particularly frustrating environment and has continued to be that way and I, I rail and push against that particular frustration. Um, 
In that context, I've always believed, with many others, that perhaps one of the most seminal and transformative scientific discoveries of the 20th century was, well, pot potentially dual use. So let me uh, quote in part, and I'll, 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 ex I'll extract or redact the name of the virus. Most of you will know what this is, of course. Uh, the isolation and typing of blank virus for man has been in past a laborious and time-consuming procedure since it depended on the intracerebral inoculation of monkeys. Therefore, we sought to determine whether the agents could be recovered from feces or suspensions of spinal cord. Um, the presence of a cytopathic agent was revealed by differences in pH that occurred in these tissue cultures as compared with control. Subsequently, the antigenic type of the agent was isolated and determined. Indeed, when large amounts of virus are present, it has been possible by simultaneously carrying out both steps in the system to demonstrate the virus in feces within 48 hours. Well, if I ask you all to tell me what that was, you would tell me that that was a quote from the Nobel acceptance speech of John Enders, Frederick Robbins, and Tom Weller in December of 1954 and their discovery of the use of tissue culture to grow polio. In that seminal presentation, they also described that they had discovered at the same time that those same cultures were, could be used to grow mumps, they could be used to grow varicella virus, um, they could be used to grow um, other, other viruses as well. And so, um, and they make some fascinating comments about that at the end. So uh, I, I, I couldn't help but think in that context that this could be concerned to something that would suddenly had changed the transspecies potential of many different viruses um, and the ability to grow them. And so I, I put that in the context of, of what we're interested in, what we're discussing here, because I think that fundamentally changed really the history of vaccinology, the history of infectious disease, and our capacity to really be sitting here and even having these conversations today. And so um, what, what we rail against is, 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 in some senses, the unknown as we try to investigate these things. And, and so um, I, I want to quote another luminary who said, uh, there are knowns and there are things that we know. We also know that there are unknowns. And we know that there are things that we don't know. And finally, uh, there are unknown unknowns. There are things that we don't know that we don't know. And of course, you all know that that was stated eloquently by Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, and, uh, and, but whether I'm, where I may differ from, from um, my English major background, I think I favor it from a scientific background in the sense of it's, the, it's areas that we can't really understand until we are in a position to try to investigate them. So I like to put that in the context of our discussion. So um, I guess I want to then really tell you why we came to what we did and where we went from, where we went from there. Uh, first of all, as I said, our commitment to understand, my overall commitment to understanding these complicated questions of when there's an agent that we can't study. And coronaviruses, we're pretty good at that because human coronaviruses that cause respiratory infections are notoriously difficult to culture and require extensive passage. And once you're working with them, you're not really working with the primary agent anymore because it's been modified so much. Um, I was, at the time this happened, I had worked with coronavirus for 20 years as the SARS epidemic came out uh, with this fairly innocuous, low-grade, humble virus family that suddenly, uh, that suddenly had a violent, rogue serial killer lurking in the background. And so to trying to really understand what that happened. Now, fortunately, SARS grew in culture. But what couldn't be answered from those kinds of questions was the issues of where did it come from? How did it make a transition and become a human virus? How did it interact with human cells and copy itself inside those cells? So how did it replicate? Why did it cause more severeness in adults? How did it have such a significant ability to spread in certain populations? So trying to understand that predicated trying to understand where it came from. And where it came from was based on two excellent articles in science, suggested strongly that it came from bats, from a bat background. So, the, the issue, however, with that, with many coronaviruses and with many, many other important viruses, I'll na to name a few, um, such as the human noroviruses, which are a very, very important virus group, are very, very difficult to propagate in culture. And uh, parenthetically, I wonder if these discussions or concerns would be raised if, if it were about uh, the capacity and ability to robustly and easily have grown hepatitis C early on in its, uh, in its, epidemic, uh, in its epidemic stages. So we wanted to understand these things. We wanted to try to understand prospectively rather than in some kind of a viral archaeology or backgazing how a virus could have come from a bat and come into humans. So we could have tried to look backwards and try to maybe make sense of mutations, or we proposed that it was important to potentially try to look forward and see if we could have a platform for recovering a non-cultivatable virus and thereby using that to test the steps by which a virus might move forward. 
So um, that question, I believe, is a fun and still believe, is a fundamental question with any zoonosis, and zoonoses, as we all know, are increasing in their, in their frequency. Um, so that was the rationale for, con for conducting this virus. So what is that informed us? And I want to talk now just very briefly about the science and then a, a minute about the, about the uh, communication of the science. First about the science, what did we do? Well, we had the capacity already for making these viruses um, by reverse genetics, a, a, a segmented, uh, it's, it's non-segmented virus, but we segmented the cDNA pieces, put them together. This was the exceptional work of Boyd Yount and Ralph Barrick's lab. It's, it, I believe, brilliant. And um, we, that was already in place. So when the, when the sequences were published on bat, bat viruses, basically from sequencing of bat feces and other secretions, no viruses were available, no RNA was available. They were impossible to study. We looked at those sequences and through a group consensus came up with a mechanism for um, identifying a consensus gene sequence that then we could uh, have synthetically made. It was not SARS. It was a different bat virus, but likely related to the virus that caused SARS. And so then we uh, had those pieces synthesized. Um, and those synthetic pieces, then we could ligate together as cDNAs, generate an RNA genome, electroporate that into cells, and hopefully recover virus. So in that context, then, were many, many steps. How did we, how, did, how and why did we start? Well, I had, the, um, I had the advantage of history and the advantage of reading Dr. Ramshaw's work and other work and seeing the kinds of uh, positive and challenging things that it had engendered. And thus, we're in a position to think about this. I was also chair of the Vanderbilt Biosafety Committee at the time. So we um, basically en engaged in communication and identified who are the stakeholders and who would care. So who, at the, at the outset, would be interested in being informed in this? Certainly NIH program, um, certainly our own institutions, from the level, all the way from the level of biosafety through the um, through our communications officers, and, and once that happened, through the vice chancellor and the chancellor, <laughs> we're interested. Uh, as working during the SARS epidemic with different organizations such as the Defense Threat Reduction Agency and the WHO, we're also aware of their general interest and surprisingly their general willingness to try to understand complicated questions and to try to help engage. And so we communicated with uh, um, friends at the time um, who were engaged at the CDC and the respiratory diseases branch to inform them. We differentiated always between who we felt we needed to inform and who we needed to ask permission or to get input from. Um, so uh, NIH program, CDC respiratory branch. We convened a, a group of our dual biosafety committees at UNC and Vanderbilt. We asked for input also from a policy ethics and law corps at, at Duke that was established as part of one of the regional centers of excellence. Um, and as projects were going forward, we made time points in terms of when we would communicate with an IH program or with the um, CDC or with anybody if we felt that we were, uh, if there was a surprise or we felt that something was getting out of um, hand. We also maintained conditions that were uh, absolutely required for, that we would use for SARS. So there was, uh, and, we, and we made, um, it, we didn't change security issues at that point because we felt that bios, at that level the biosafety that we're using for SARS also represented the best security for what we were doing. So I won't go on in, 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 in any other detail. I will come to a conclusion on this. But we also finally had a, 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 we convened a session at the time the manuscript was submitted. Where the manuscript was submitted, then we convened a group of all of these interested individuals. We asked for involvement from NIH, who appropriately de demurred and said, um, we do not believe it's appropriate for us to be involved in the decision making, but we would like to be informed of any decision that you come to and what the process is. Um, and then um, we established some guidelines that we would use in terms of response for publication at different levels. So if we were told we couldn't, if we were told we shouldn't, if we were told um, that um, other organizations needed to be involved, how we would escalate and what additional information we would ask for. Surprisingly, in that process, there was, there was great consensus and unanimity about the value and importance of the research and how these processes that were in place were, were, were appropriate for, for managing. Was there anything we did not publish? Well, there was one thing, and that was um, we published the sequence of the virus, but we didn't publish the sequence of the primer termini of the, of the plasmids. 
because we felt that that is information that any credible investigator would want to get from us anyway, and we would need to help them with the art as well as the science of reproducing this work. So um, would it prevent work, reproduction? No. Would it um, make it so that there would have to be due diligence or it would be harder? Yes. So that, that kind of gives you the kind of the framework of, of what, we're, what we're working on. Um, we believe that this kind of work is important. I think it's a legacy in building on the shoulders of, of giants, the concept of growing and cultivating these viruses, so the fundamental principles in place and the capacity to study uh, viruses and their movement from, from other species to humans, uh, we believe is a, a fundamental uh, important principle. And with that, I will stop and thank you all for uh, your attention. Thank you. Thanks. A thank you, Mark. Uh, for that nice summary, the the paper that he was discussing was published in PNA, uh, uh, the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science in 2008, I believe. Um, let's go to the panel and and discuss some of the issues that might uh, fall out of this uh, uh, of this case study. Uh, the first would be, what role should an institutional biosafety committee, a reviewing body? consultative group have in evaluating research with uh, potential biosafety, biosecurity concerns. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sudoyo, would, would you have thoughts or comments on that? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, I think the role of the institutional biosafety or bio-risk committee is very, very important. But uh, whether it is uh, the institution is actually prepared to do some evaluation uh, from the biosafety point of view because the concept of biosecurity is new. Biological safety concept is, uh, has been recognized widely, although uh, I could say that it might not be implemented uh, fully, but biosecurity concept is definitely a new in the country. So we have to actually, the concept has to be introduced first to the, uh, the committee that uh, dual use research of concern also should be evaluated. So I think uh, if, if you ask me the role, the role is actually, they play important role, but we have to give them, the committee, uh, knowledge on the biosecurity and dual use research of concern, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Just an added question. How do you feel the scientists uh, would, would they accept this kind of a role for the, the biosafety committee easily? They, they accept the biosafety because biosafety is kind of actually protected the human being and the environment. But concept of biosecurity, uh, well, it's some majority uh, do not accept that. Frankly. Thank you. Dr. Reed, uh, do you have any further thoughts uh, on this? Or? Um, thank you. Uh, I guess I could just add on a little bit more because I couldn't agree more with Dr. Sudoyo um, that maybe one model, I think Dr. Seglet mentioned it earlier too, is, is when we consider the time it's taken to, to get us to be more sensitized to uh, human subject research and the lessons that we learned and the, the effort that's gone into uh, formation of uh, institutional review boards and ethical review committees. And that was not something that happened overnight, clearly. And it's taken, there are lots of uh, events and um, um, historical events that, that have happened that has helped to form that. And um, it's, it's formed in, in one country or in one situation. And, and in order to percolate, percolate that, to, to the biosafety committees or other committees that take on oversight or review of research. Uh, I think you, need, you do need to have this educational component or sensitization component. Those of us who have had the uh, privilege of being on ethical review committees and reviewing science, I, I think that the review of science, um, issues of concern, the quality of science, uh, it's, it's probably better to, to put the dual use concerns embedded into that as a, as a paradigm versus 
to have that completely separate. If you're trying to reach out to scientists and researchers, actually conceptualizing and principal investigators who are conducting uh, such such research. Um, so I, I, that, that would be my, my suggestion. Thank you for that. So I think your point about, uh, about human use and being an analogous situation uh, reminds me of the Animal Welfare Act when that was implemented in, in the U.S. Uh, it was it was very much the same situation, and it, and in all of these these situations, I think the the importance of leadership in our laboratories uh, comes to the fore, leadership at the top as well as leadership at the at the departmental level and so on in in implementing and underscoring the importance and the relevance of uh, of these kinds of uh, uh, new situations. So I think Dr. Reed's comments lead perfectly to our next question, which is how prepared are institutional biosafety committees to make determinations of dual-use research of concern and to provide guidance for research design and evaluation? Dr. Sayajo. Thank you. Um, uh, to t uh, let me uh, introduce the situation of on the issue of dual use research concern in Japan uh, to all of you. Uh, in Japan, uh, biosafety and biosecurity issues are well recognized among the scientists, uh, especially in the field of uh, medical and infectious disease uh, scientists. But uh, the issue of dual use research concern is still not, is not were well recognized as uh, important issues. So to tell uh, if uh, in our institute we are publishing the paper ja Japanese Journal of Infectious Diseases, but at uh, this moment uh, we do not have a criteria uh, for the publication or rejection of the paper based on the dual use research in concern. And uh, also, our institute, NIIT, has uh, strict regulations on the biosafety and biosecurity issues, but uh, the discussion on the dual use research in concern is uh, delayed uh, than the issue of the biosafety and biosecurity issues. I want to uh, promote the, the importance and uh, importance to recognize this dual use research in concern to the public, uh, uh, to the society of the Japanese uh, scientific fields. And what I want to emphasize is that the research activities, in, especially for the medical and uh, radionuclear uh, issues or chemicals, must be uh, conducted based on the public trust. We never forget this fact. So I think that the balance of between the scientific interest and the, uh, for, and the benefit and harm to the public should always be considered. Uh, for these purposes, uh, I think that the, each institute or universities must uh, establish the committees uh, to evaluate uh, the dual use research concern problems on, on the research works. And finally, uh, I want to emphasize the importance of the, the education of the young generation who will become the, the scientists in the future, uh, not only for the technical or ethical issues or a scientific interest, but also we have to educate the young young generations on the issue of the ethical uh, problems, including the, the dual use research in concern. Thank you. May I, may I make a brief comment on that? Um, I was, as I mentioned, the chair of the Vanderbilt Institutional Biosafety Committee at the time all this was going on, so obviously I had to recuse myself from their direct considerations. Um, 
but we had an exceptionally good community involvement, and we had a committee that had worked together for many years and actually enjoyed it, believe it or not, and so they stayed together. But the um, the issue was they they felt that this the concept of, of evaluating security in a prospective fashion. There are two aspects of it. One is is issue of security, physical security, right, of of something you're actually doing, and the second one is security implications which is outside the venue of, of almost everyone, including myself, because it's, again, is I don't know what I don't know. In other words, I don't know what the security implications are because I'm not in a clearance mechanism to have information related to what they might be. So it's difficult for me to predict them and to understand them. Um, and so, but from the position of the committee, they were profoundly interested in issues of, of safety, and our, and our education is, is around the concept that increased safety equals in, increased security, but increased security does not necessarily indicate increased safety. And so as a primary goal, I, I think the Spanish word for this, bioseguridad, which incorporates both terms, is, is a more integrative term that I think reflects how we try to approach it as part of our committee. So they, they felt in, in not good about that. That's why we got a consultative uh, role of people, particularly from the, Pel the Policy Ethics and Law Corps, and from other individuals. We invited anyone who wanted to participate in that process to help with the committee. Um, and also we used terminology which was, I think, more helpful to the committee, like, um, what scares the hell out of you about this research? Okay, what scares you and why? What would you, what is it that you think that we should do differently? Why, why are you scared? What movie have you seen? What is it that's scaring you? What are you acting on? What information do you have? What do, information do we need for you to make a more informed decision? So the process of evaluating our research was actually the actual process of educating the committee in terms of being able to, to do this. So I would never participated in their determinations, but I did participate in their discussions and in the process to try to, to, try to use this as a, as a case to actually go through the educational process. And I think it almost requires that because these things being discussed philosophically or ex vacuo are, are just really, really, really difficult to get your minds around as a group. Thank you for that, Mark. Uh, the next question I have is what systems have been established in countries in the region to regulate biosafety and biosecurity issues? Uh, how is the potential for dual use uh, in research evaluated? We've covered some of those points, but do you have anything um, to add to that, Dr. Sayojo? Yeah. Um, at this moment, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the dual use research of concern is not well recognized in Japan. But recently, we have uh, started to discuss to implement uh, the regulations based on the dual use research and concern among the uh, by defense committees funded by the Ministry of Education and Science and Technology. And uh, uh, we have, to, uh, I think that uh, we will uh, declare the code of conduct based uh, for the dual use research in concern from the Japanese Society for Biology or Japanese Society for Vaccinology or Microbiology or Academy of Science. So uh, in Japan, uh, I think that uh, we promote uh, this issue, uh, dual use research in concern. Uh, to the public or to the scientists working in the field of microbiology or other medical sciences. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel, either on that question or on uh, Dr. Dennison's uh, follow on to Dr. Dennison's? Uh, yes. Uh, I have uh, Frank, uh, another practical question to the, Dr. Dennison. Uh, the recombinant virus produced from the SARS bad SARS coronavirus like coronavirus was uh, ident uh, is uh, biosafety two or three or four pathogens. How, how high the biosafety level of, for the recombinant virus? Uh, so a couple comments. One is, uh, you know, SARS-like is a nom de guerre, right? It's a, it's a, it's sort of a pseudonym. It's not SARS. It's a bat coronavirus. I'm, now, I'm not questioning your question. I'm, I'm saying this is what we, we've, we've dealt with. This was a, 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 a virus that lived in a closely related, very closely related family, and allowed us to do this work, which we were very fortunate at. Um, 
so we established, even though there was absolutely zero evidence that this was transmissible to humans, that we would maintain it to be a cell three under all conditions. That if, that if there was any evidence in culture that it had increased virulence compared to SARS, that we would stop the work until we had had further consultations with uh, NIH program and other individuals who might be we might consider perm stakeholders. So we set up we established time points along the way to see if, if this was main, if this was uh, if this was maintaining itself in, in a good way. Um, we also. Um, the, uh, the, what we did is we also, as I mentioned, this algorithm that infection does not equal transmission, does not equal inf um, transmissibility, does not equal maintenance in another population. We often view infection as a high jump. We use that term, unfortunately, jump. And uh, probably a much more valid term would be a 440 hurdles, right, where uh, someone is falling down at every hurdle. The virus has to get over a lot of obstacles. And so we, we, we established the guidelines in terms of incrementally trying to look at this and seeing if at any stage we were seeing a change that indicated us that this indicated that it might have evolved something that could represent a human pathogen. And so that's, we, we, it, it was a single process initially in terms of establishing a BSL-3. We will not come out of BSL-3 with this virus. On the other hand, we also set positive time posts that said, at this point, we will stop and reconsider our work independently uh, before moving forward with it if we feel like this direction is changing. And so we were continually evaluating it. It was sort of open source communication in a long way, and partly because we, were, we had a lot of hubris and we said we can do this and no one else can beat us to it. So we felt comfortable with moving ahead with our work, but, but that wasn't the reason we did it. But, but we felt that we could move forward with the work in any case. Dual use research of concern raises issues of publication. In light of th this case study, what is the best way to approach journals about a publication based on research of potential dual use research of concern? This question is open to anyone on the panel. Or Jeff. Mark, it seems as you were describing your experience and the decisions and the consultations you held about publishing and how much and when and where and whatnot, that to some extent you would be chastised um, for not having expected the unexpected. Yet that belies the very nature of scientific research. I mean, we, that's what makes it challenging. That's what makes it fun. I mean, of course we expect the unexpected. That's research. Um, I'm wondering. You know, the question specifically is about at the end stage, but when you're going through the research itself and, and you're having hopefully the aha moments and hopefully not too many of the oh no moments, um, beginning to formulate where this might really be going and, and what you might be publishing and how many pieces this might turn out to be, you know, and that sort of thing. Where in that thinking process, as you're discovering, as you're making sense out of your data and planning your next steps, just as you're thinking about when is the time to engage NIH or research sponsors or the or colleagues as, as your experience was, is that parallel to, is that a first and, and then subsequent to the notion of the publication part? Or is that all one basic consideration on your part as a research? I think they're absolutely continuum, and I think in the nature of this kind of research that that engagement is, I, I don't see what the disadvantage to that engagement is. Um, we, we ask for review and comments all along the way. We set up guidelines at the level of publication, so when we finally submitted it for publication, we did review, but I felt the, I felt the peer review was absolutely, uh, you know, sine qua non. It was essential. We had to maintain the integrity of it. So I informed NIH that this had been submitted for peer review. I informed them um, that if they wanted additional information or the manuscript, I would call the, I would contact the journal and ask their permission and tell them NIH had requested this, and and we would submit it to them. But at that point, the journal had had dominance. I felt like over over uh, other possibilities of review if we had done them ahead of time. So we established, and I wrote a long letter to the program officer to talk about here's the way that I would do this. Here's the mechanism and pathways I would use to handle this. If you have concerns about this or feel this needs to be elevated to a different level, please inform me 
immediately. If the um, if if a group tells me that they feel that this should be non-published, I would like I would require an explanation. And ultimately, and then if I couldn't publish my work, I'd like to publish an, uh, I would I would uh, like to publish an article that discussed the mechanism by which redaction or or loss of ability to publish the work was done. That I think is a balance between academic freedom, the importance of of novel research that can't necessarily predict it in a positive way, and the and the um, and the requirements for excellent peer review and our ability to say that we're willing to forego something if it's really in the public interest. Okay, so those things are all, those are all balanced. But it was a continuum, and so at the time of publication of submission, we, um, I informed, we wrote a letter to the journal, we told them of these concerns, I recommended if they wanted to write an editorial, I thought that would be cool. And that here's some names of people, including several people who are on the NSABB, uh, I said, call these people, write them, and um, if you need to share the manuscript with them, that's certainly, you have my permission to do that. If they feel like a, co a cooperative editorial is good, that would be great. And so I, I, I encouraged that process because I, I thought it would be cool, and plus, you know, I, I, li I like the idea of a further and more detailed discussion of the implications of the work. Well, if I may, let me ask about superimposing that process and experience on what our colleagues from Asia Pacific have described as challenges, and Dr. Stoya, your, your word was frustrations in your own research communities. Um, Dr. Stoya, you said, in fact, the majority of the researchers wouldn't even accept this kind of um, looking over the shoulder or meddling with uh, you know, individual researchers' data and, and conclusions prior to publications. Um, what would we need to do? How could we foster um, a greater acceptance or at least paying attention to lessons learned from the, the process that Dr. Dennison just described to make it less ominous or less intrusive to your own researchers in Asia Pacific countries? Is there something peculiar, unusual, or special uh, culturally or otherwise in terms of government regulation or whatnot in the Asia Pacific region that would either block this kind of lesson learned or perhaps facilitate it? Yeah, we have conducted a roadshow uh, on uh, biosafety, biosecurity, uh, and code of conduct. And before we could actually uh, introduce the code of conduct on biosecurity to the audience, we introduced the concept of biosafety and biosecurity and also dual use. To be able to uh, get people know about dual use, then we use actually uh, some study cases. So when we introduce them, uh, people don't think that they actually do it. Uh, well, they, they don't expect that dual use research of concern is being part of their work. So it is very difficult, actually, uh, from my experience in that three roadshow, uh, to have the concept of that dual use. I have to introduce them that uh, some uh, study or or uh, the, bi the weaponization, say the, the so-called, uh, I, I could say that kind of things, uh, because the concept is not there. The biosecurity is new. So you have to actually get people know, all of the life scientists, of the researcher, about the biosecurity first, in my opinion, at that time, and then introduce dual use research of concern before we could develop code of conduct. That's my experience. Did you have another comment? Yes, please. I think that um, dual use research concerning issues should be recognized internationally, not only in each country. So this, for these purposes, we, uh, we have to promote the discussion uh, issues of the dual use research concern under the international organizations like uh, such as WHO or United Nations. Uh, we have a framework of the Global Health Security Action Group uh, in the developed countries 
G7 countries, including the Mexico. And uh, we also discussing about the issue of the dual use researching concern. So definition of the dual use is very, very difficult, uh, important to evaluate uh, the risk of the dual use for each uh, research project. So I, uh, I re recommend uh, to promote discussions on the issue of the dual use research concern internationally or in the Asian Pacific regional, regional uh, countries or United States or finally in the internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Those are both excellent comments. Uh, Dr. Miller, if you have a comment with regard to that, let's, let's go there. And then I think we have time for one question from the audience uh, before we wrap up this section. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, there's a lot of discussion about institutional biosafety committees and the role they might play, but I think what's particularly instructive about what we heard from Dr. Dennison is that the very thorough and thoughtful process that was conducted uh, to, to, to look at, at this, the research you described was instigated and organized by the investigators um, and their colleagues. And I, I hope that that's sort of a, uh, a, a paradigm that we can all move forward with as a, as a partnership, certainly with regulatory um, um, agencies, et cetera, but also coming from, from the grassroots, from the investigators themselves. I don't know if, if I could just comment, I found that to be incredibly educational for me. I, mean, I found that the people in the, in the, from the communities, from the defense community to the, um, to the an analysis community, like the DIA, um, DTRA, uh, CDC, WHO, actually once they were understood the details and why and what the motivations were, were more interested in being helpful and in trying to, under and trying to understand this. And it also altered their perception of real risk associated with this, um, rather than just presenting the concept that now we have a virus that can gr grow in one species of cells and now it can grow in the other, as opposed to a dichotomous view that the gradations were seen. So it was educational all around, and it, it felt like a collaborative process that involved not just scientists, but involved uh, people who might have, a, ha have uh, had the tendency or the desire to top regulate. They rather became sort of more partners. I'm, I'm sounding a little Pollyanna maybe, but it, it was really the experience that we ended up having. These are, these are excellent comments and, and I think sort of lessons learned or observed from this, uh, this scenario. And, and again, your last comments, Mark, underscore the importance of communication uh, vertically and horizontally and globally uh, with regard to these issues. I think it, it's, uh, it's just so important that we, we keep talking. So do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, please identify yourself and... Uh... I'm Janet Peterson from the University of Maryland College Park in the USA. And I just wanted to say that um, it would be helpful to the IBCs to be given tools to be able to review and evaluate dual-use research of concern. Many scientists, at least that I've spoken with, equate dual-use research with either not being able to do their research or not being able to publish. and the IBC does not want to be the ones to tell them they can't do that. The IBC supports research, and we work with the researchers to do it safely. And if you'd give us the tools or give these researchers and the scientists the education, the information, these um, roadshows that you're talking about, which actually are a little reminiscent, I believe, of when the early days of recombinant DNA research and NIH, I believe, sponsored programs. And there were a group of researchers, Dr. Emmett Barkley and Dr. Uh, Don Vesley, among others, who went to different locations and described this and provided the education. And I think that would be really very helpful to the IBCs. So we'll take one more question from the audience and then uh, turn to the panel. So this is Dennis Dixon from the NIH, and I'd like to engage Dr. Dennison in a response to something we actually did together through the intermediary of the program officer, and that is in response to the question about what about tools, is when Dr. Dennison first contacted his program officer, I suggested that the reference be made to the NSAB tools posted on the website at the NIH, and there is an excellent communication tool with a risk analysis that walks you through the process. and so. 
I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Dennison if he could comment on the utility of that tool and uh, how that worked. Um, it was very helpful to us in terms of identif uh, identifying what, what the, um, the criteria were that we met. Um, we, we, just, we made a, an active determination to use those criteria for our determination of potential dual use of concern. Although in, in parallel, in my, in my heart of hearts, I, I think that it wasn't, um, I, did I necessarily ag agree that those really represented a level of risk for our virus? I don't really think I did, but nevertheless, we felt that those were established as guidelines that we should use those as a mechanism to move forward with our work. And so I think they are very helpful. Another thing that's actually helpful and educational is the, the Policy Ethics and Law Corps from CIRSEB um, on that side is, has an excellent educational um, tool as well that, that I recommend anybody. I'm using it for my students and for people that do RCR. It's very easy to do. It's very helpful and very useful. Um, I'd like to comment also briefly on the issue of, of tools for the IBCs. I find that um, one ounce of example is worth about 100 pounds of, of roadshows. Um, so in other words, if there's a case or a case study or a mechanism to do something that would be even an unknown, then uh, they're in a position to make judgments. And finally, that I don't believe, um, I might be heretical here, I don't believe IBC should be in, put in a position of telling someone they can't publish their research, there shouldn't be a blockade. Uh, IBC, as we all know, those are fun uh, they're, they're funky in the sense that they're actually guidelines that sort of semi have the, have the uh, qualifications of regulations uh, in the BMBL. So, it's, so I think that um, uh, giving them the potential to give their input and insight, ask for additional help and consultation, uh, make recommendations, and make recommendations that it's out of their league as well is important because I had a very informed and educated IBC and they were profoundly uncomfortable with anything that was at the level of trying to determine an issue of bio-risk and, and potential biosecurity implications going forward. So I think if we can relieve them of that burden and give them tools that this is a consultation and advisory capacity, and they're not in a position to actually block research, rather to facilitate the investigator's ability to achieve their goals, then it becomes a collaborative uh, process. And that's kind of how I like to view it and would hope going forward educationally we could do. Thank you for that. Uh, we, we probably have time for a quick question and a really quick answer. This is just a quick comment. I wanted to also mention there's some educational resources available on the website of the NIH Office of Biotechnology Activities, including an educational video and a brochure that we disseminate to institutions, associations that they in turn can disseminate to the investigator community just to raise awareness about the issue. Excellent. Uh, I think this last uh, five minutes has, has pointed out the, the need and the value, uh, the need for and the value of, uh, of guidelines and of principles and then maybe of even in the weeds tools to help manage uh, the whole process uh, of, of science and publication of that science. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the panel, uh, thank uh, in particular uh, Dr. Dennison for presenting this particular case study. And we are going to take a short break. And we will return at five minutes after the hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>